Um, so, hi you guys. <laughs> so we have a nice group of, of regulars that attend and um, Jeanette and I have been doing this book discussion, oh, probably for the past, uh, Jeanette did it um, for years in person and I joined her probably about three or four years ago. And then we've been meeting on Zoom, right guys? And uh, it's been working out pretty well. So when Jeanette reached out to you and, and you accepted uh, her invitation, we were all pretty excited. So nice. uh, welcome, we're glad you're here. Thank you. um, and uh, you know, we can start talking about the book and I know I have a couple questions for you and um, I, I'm thinking that um, a number of people here do. Yeah. Um, I am trying to text Jeanette. So if you don't mind, if I do that, does somebody else want to uh, at least start or, or Stuart, if you want to even talk a little bit about, about yourself, um, I'm sure I'll, we'd all love to hear it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the book and, and how the book came to be. Okay, uh, that'd be great. Uh, originally, I had the idea for the book probably around 1993 or four. Um, and I had the very first image, which is um, the doors of a convenience smart right off the interstate rolling open and someone walking in and no one being there. Um, and obviously the person who had been working there has been, who knows, they're just not there. Uh, and I had that in my mind for a long, long time and I couldn't quite figure out how to, the word for it, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't dramatize it. I couldn't get into it, I couldn't find a way in. I didn't know what I was doing with it. I had the image, but that was it. Um, so in 1997, I started a book called Wish You Were Here, which was a very naturalistic view of a family on their summer vacation. Uh, it's very long, it's very sprawling, it's not really plotted that much. But one of the sub stories or one of the sub lines or B or C lines even is um, the, uh, the sun becomes fascinated by this girl who has disappeared in the town um, where they're staying for vacation. And he becomes, you know, sort of falls in some sort of uh, infatuation with the case and keeps following it through the local papers. Um, it's never really resolved um, in, in Wish You Were Here. And it, it's this little sidelight that it doesn't make any sense tonally whatsoever because the rest of the book is very pastoral and very quiet. And this is this very strange and, and extreme and possibly violent thing that happened. So I never quite was able to, to work with it. And I came back to it after I'd finished that book, uh, which came out on, I think, 2000, I think. Um, and so I came back to it and I started thinking, who finds the empty convenience mark? Who walks into the Kogos um, and finds it empty? And I started thinking about you know, who's a tentpole character Who's someone who has a connection to the rest of the people in town? And so I started thinking of a policeman, uh, either a sheriff or a deputy or just you no know, patrol person. Um, and so I started sending this cop around this small town off the interstate and have him bump into different people that were going to be in the book. And some of the people that he bumped into were um, a pair of teenagers that were corralling the shopping carts at the very end of a night in a, um, a grocery store parking lot. And one of them had had brain damage from being in an accident that the other one had actually caused. And I thought, okay, that's, that's kind of a neat little couple that I have there. And I, and, but I couldn't get that one going either. Um, and so I sent the cop around again. And during one of his day shifts, he found a woman who was driving to um, the, the family's lake cottage for the very last time because they were going to sell the lake cottage. And so that book turned, that was Wish You Were Here. Um, the book with the teenagers turned into The Night Country, which involves a car accident. Um, so again, I wanted to get into this one particular image and one story, and I couldn't get there. Um, so four or five years later, three or four books later, um, sadly, uh, one of my friend's partner's, my friend's partner's mother went missing in Iowa. 
Um, mm. She lived by herself. She was in her 70s. She was rather adventurous. And um, she was she was simply one day she didn't turn up um, and they couldn't get in touch with her. And so my friend told me all about everything that she and her partner went through trying to find her partner's mother. And at that point, I realized that the story was not a story about the policeman or a story about the town. It was a story about the people that were closest to this person who disappeared. It was going to be, if it was a teenage girl, it would be the mother, the father, the sister, the friend, the, the, the best girlfriend, and the boyfriend. And that would be my point of view organization. It would be organized emotionally. Um, and whatever happened, happened. Whatever you had to go through procedurally, when you're looking for a missing person, they would all have to go through that. Um, and at the end, they would either find her or they would not find her. Um, and I wasn't sure exactly which way I was going to go as I was writing along. Um, and, you know, once I had that, I, I think it was pretty, um, not, not simple, but I, I could put myself in the position of most of those characters um, and what they're going through and what's, what's on their minds um, from day to day. Um, and the thing that surprised me most about the book was that Lindsay, the younger sister, in the second half of the book begins to take the book over. Um, she begins to be the person who has the most, the most moral confusion. Uh, and her moral confusion is around her identity. And, and who she is, you know, is she simply Kim's sister? Um, is, she, is she allowed to be her own person? Um, and so she has to fight to be her own person. Um, and, and in the end, I, I, I didn't think that I would end the book with her. Um, I, I thought that she would be in a way a secondary character to you know, the boyfriend, her best friend, the mother and the father. But I, I think she surprised me by being that strong and by making some really hard, hard decisions about how she was going to live her life. So, so that was exciting because sometimes you're, when you're writing a book, you go in and you think you're going to get something and you, you, might, you might get it. But sometimes you go in and you find this thing that you had no clue was there. And that to me is, is what's really exciting about writing. Um, that, that, it's not schematic then it's not it's not written in stone it's not it's not greek tragedy it shows that, that people still have some some power of will um and, and to make some very difficult choices i would like to apologize for the book being incredibly grindingly sad it is an amazing <laughs> am incredibly yeah. sad book i mean I, I it took me like let's say a year and a half to actually write the draft and when i got the draft where i wanted it i sat down after letting it sit for a while. And I read the thing from the start to finish and I finished it and I'm like, oh my God, that is so terribly sad. You know, I, I felt bad for putting the reader through the ordeal <laughs> there with, with very little relief. And, and there's certainly very little, what's the word for it? Um, there's very little conventionality going on in the book. I don't really leave the reader a way out or a way to shrug off what's happening. Um, and, and one of the reviewers, I think it was Ron Charles in the Washington Post said, it's not really a novel, it's real life. And I was like, that's exactly what I was shooting for to show that realism still has the power um, to move us emotionally. It's, it's not just, the novel is not just an empty form or a plaything, I think. Um, and so people that went into it with, with the, the expectations of genre uh, were, were sorely disappointed. <laughs> And, and, we're, and, we're, and we're given something completely different. Um, but that, of course, is my MO. That's what I do. I, I lure you in the door. Uh, and once you get far enough in, I slam the door and turn the lights out. And all the terrible things happen right in front of you. Um, so in that sense, it's very much, for me, at the time, a, a father of teenage children, a horror novel. It is the very worst thing that could possibly happen, happening to you. And it's inescapable. Um, and, and for that, I felt really terrible um, and, and still do in a way. Um, but I feel I still feel great uh, love and, and pity and, and mercy, I think, for, for everybody um, involved there. 
uh, for Elise and JP and, and Lindsay and, and Fran and Ed, especially, who really don't know what to do. Um, they don't know what to do about anything, and especially about each other and how they feel about each other with respect to Kim. Uh, they don't know what to do with Lindsay at all. They really don't know what to do with their community anymore. Uh, they're, they're, they're cut off in a very strange way, in a very sad way. Um, so, so that, that was my experience in writing the book. Uh, as with A Prayer for the Dying, after I finished the book, my wife told me that I was, I seem to be much better, that I seem to be acting much happier now. Um, <laughs> uh, which is absolutely true, because it, it was, it's a very, very sad world. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a world I really wanted to write about um, physically, um, the lake towns up there on Lake Erie. Um, I, I've, I've been visiting them for the last, 50 years, like Chautauqua and Wish You Were Here. Um, and they're just really fascinating towns to me, kind of amazing little towns that used to be steel towns and now don't have a lot going on there. Um, so again, I wanted to use that realism. Uh, I did a lot of legwork uh, up around there in Conneaut, Ashtabula, North Kingsville, um, drove around, looked at the spots, you know, went to the Chamber of Commerce, you know, started looking at the real estate listings as if Ed were selling the houses. Um, you know, took the virtual tours of all the houses and you know, just, just wow. learned the area, which is, which is a great pleasure you know, to, to be able to fulfill your curiosity about anything, but especially a place um, is a real privilege. Um, so, plus, I knew that no one had ever written about that town before. No one's ever going to write about that town again. Um, <laughs> so it felt like, in, in a weird way, fresh territory, like, like that snow that doesn't have any tracks in it. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and I could pick and choose the details because they were all mine because no one else was paying attention. No one else would think that North Kingsville was a place worthy of writing about, um, which again is one of my great joys in writing. If I'm not writing about Scott Fitzgerald or about Niagara Falls, I'm usually writing about some place people don't really care a whole lot about or don't see as, as great material, right? Um, like like the, the Red Lobster in, you know, in New Britain. Um, no, nobody really cares about that, no. or the one in Torrington that closed down. But um, anyway, that was my experience in writing the book. Mm. Um, when it came out, um, I think it, I think it got pretty good reviews. It sold okay. Um, my editor hated the book; just hated the book. Um, he was he was not a fan. Um, he did not want to accept the book, um, and so. Uh, luckily, there was a senior editor that had also read the manuscript that said, you're crazy. You know, this is a great book. Um, and it ended up being, I believe, the last book I worked with my editor on before he left um, and took over at Mulholland Books over at Little Brown. So now he now he publishes J.K. Rowling and uh, wow. Tanya French and a bunch of other really good writers over there. Uh, and it's still still a great friend. Um, but she's a horrible line reader, just a terrible tin ear, total tin ear. Uh, anyway, any questions at all? Yes, this is Karen. Um, I'm the cyber ghost. <laughs> um, a couple of things puzzled me. Um, why didn't you make clear what happened, exactly what happened to Kim, how she got into this place where she was, you know, dead and just right now bones. Um, how, how did this happen to her? And I had the, the, the feeling, the nagging feeling for quite a while that maybe she took off on her own. And I wondered if you had intended that because um, she was not happy with her life. She looked like she was happy with it. She was successful on many levels, but she was... Um, not looking forward to her college year. She did not really want to go to Bowling Green. And she did not particularly like the town. She thought it was a small, dull town. And she wasn't in love with her boyfriend. And that's the last we hear her think about when, when they're at that beach or whatever, whatever it is. Um, that's the last thing we hear her thinking about. And then we don't see her ever again. And I thought, did she decide to leave alone or with someone else? And I yeah, I mean, that, and that's that's why the police originally don't really want to investigate that much because they they read her the same way that that you're reading 
those clues for her. Uh, but I wanted to leave it somewhat open-ended, um, although making it clear that none of the point of view characters that were actually within during the book know that either. Um, wow. they, don't, they don't have that knowledge, that, that forehand or, or prehand knowledge. And I wanted to keep the reader in the same position as the other characters, rather okay. than sort of using the, that ironic detachment to say, here's what's really happening with her, and here's how these people are deluded. Um, I wanted their theories to be as good as any theories that the police had. Um, and okay. to have that anxiousness and that, that worry and that concern that is natural when someone that you know goes missing. Um, okay. I, and and in about three quarters the way through the very first draft of the book, I still hadn't decided whether we were going to get any clues at the end as to what happened to her. Um, mm -hmm. And so the very few clues that we do get so that you can piece together some kind of narrative at the very end. Um, I, I, I kind of grudgingly went that way. I thought that was the right way to go finally there. And there aren't, there aren't too many red herrings in there. I, I think the, 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 the boyfriend on the side, sort of the side piece there, uh, you know, um, was or woos is, you know, he may be the one red herring that's in there. And lately I've actually been thinking about writing a book about him. Mm. Um, you know, cause there's, there's one moment where I believe it's, the mother who knows that he's been to the grave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the understands yeah. that the other, the, the non-boyfriend boyfriend has been to the grave so that, that she actually meant something to him. Um, yeah. And he's in a position where he doesn't have a whole lot. You know, he's returned from his time um, at the war. He comes home, his grandmother is there. His grandmother is dying, the house is run down. He's in bad, in a very bad place in his life. And then this happens to the sort of the one good thing that was happening there. But uh, isn't it somewhat out of character for her to take up with him? I mean, she she was known as pretty stable in, in among her friends in her community, and she was committed to JP. And then all of a sudden, this Wush guy comes out of nowhere. And I thought, why? What, why? I don't think she was committed to JP. No. It's, the, it's the bad boy, the good girl and the bad boy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was well, surprised. We, we we get we get a little a little taste of that, and I think it's the first or second line uh, of the book, which it was the summer of JP. So that's yeah. all JP is getting. JP is right. getting that summer. Yeah. That's and it. She's going to college. <laughs> it's, it's it's she doesn't want to hang around with him. He may feel after she disappears that she wants that he wants to be with her more, um, but. I don't think it was ever going to happen that way. Um, she's she's not. I mean, Kim is not committed to anything. She's not committed to the town. She's not committed to JP. She's not committed to college. She's kind of. I mean, she's a young person who doesn't know what's next or where she's, she's going, but she knows mm -hmm. her future is not here in North Kingsville. It's not in her parents' house. She right. needs to get out. She needs to get away. And again, in the very first scene that we see, the first image we have of her is on break, looking at the interstate smoking, mm -hmm. watching things flying westward, right. right? It's very, I mean, and in the end, that's what happens with Lindsay, right? Mm -hmm. Lindsay's yeah. the one who fulfills that future, who fulfills the, the future Kim should have had yeah. and cut yourself off and becomes free in a way, um, but at, at a terrible price, a terrible, terrible price. And I think also, you know, having teenage or is at the time that we're looking at colleges mm. and thinking about leaving home, a lot of that was circling the book as well. Um, and I think that's, that's why we have Lindsay at the very end. She flies home um, and she flies to Erie and she says a horrible line. She says, everybody waiting for the plane to Erie looked like they came from Erie. Like, oh, oh man. Oh, man. That was a low blow. <laughs> Just brutal, just horrifyingly brutal. And she's she's counting the minutes. I mean, it's important that she's come home. She loves her parents, but she's counting the minutes until she can leave them and just be herself and be independent. Um, and that last line in the book where she, you know, she she goes up to the jetway and disappears into the crowd. Right? Yeah. She's, she's, she's not, she's no longer in, she everyone just points at her and says, that's the sister of the girl that got killed. Um, so she has to kill off part of her in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. 
sad, sad book, sad book. Very, very, <laughs> yeah, very. that's what I wanted to ask. You were breaking my heart. There were moments that were just so, I, I had to put the book down, right? <laughs> And especially once I knew you were joining us, I wanted to know True. how did you, how did you bear writing it and being in their minds? I mean, because to me, you it was like I could imagine I would think that I could imagine I would do that. I mean, who knows what you would do, right? You, but it seemed so real, and I thought, how did you live with that day after day? I, I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> It was it was it was not easy, not not easy at all. But but I, I seem to take on some of these heavier, heavier things. I mean, last night I just I did a Zoom for a university about a prayer for the dying, which is an even weirder uh, book, uh, and a book about loss and a book about what we what we refuse to let go of. Um, so it may just be one of my the themes that runs through my books, you know, uh, trying to get through an impossible situation, uh, emotionally. Mm. Um, and, and doing without the people that you love the most. Um, and that, that's certainly in Snow Angels, my very first book, even the story collections, a lot of that is about, it's about loss and trying to keep going. Um, but I think this, this book came along at the right time. I think if I had written this book when I first had the idea, then it would have been, the, the consequences would have been much more dire for the people left behind. They would not have found a way to keep going, to, to, to move on with their lives. Um, whereas by the time that I wrote the book, having written the nonfiction book, The Circus Fire, and listened to a lot of people from the area who had found a way to go through the hardest, hardest things, losing their parents, losing their best friends, losing their loved ones, losing family members. Um, I think I was more interested in, in, in endurance, you know, and the fact that we can endure all these losses mm -hmm. and that we have to endure all these losses. You know, uh, Fran and Ed were going to lose Kim anyway to college and adulthood and the world and her own life. They were going to lose her. She was going to leave the house just as Lindsay later leaves the house and leaves them alone with each other. Um, we're going to lose everybody that we love. That's the human condition. Um, this just puts it in much higher relief and much more urgent emotionally. Um, and yeah, that was, that was hard to do. Um, but there was there were gradations from I mean JP sees the world in a very different way than say Fran sees the world um, or the way that Elise sees the world or certainly the way that, that Ed or Lindsay sees the world. So I was always trying to get as close as I could to them to be as intimate as I could with them to figure out how are they going to go on? How are they going to figure mm. this out and move on? Um, and it, I mean, really hard, really, really hard. But, but by the end of the book, they're all, you know, they're all continuing to live. Um, they'll never forget Kim. Um, and, and it's never going to be easy. Um, but they found a way to just keep going, even though from time to time, often, it seemed that the world had stopped or their world had stopped. Um, and yeah. they didn't want to go on anymore. Yeah, I give you credit. I mean, there are some things that are just too painful to even want to imagine. And that you did that imagining and gave me that journey where I just, you know, the, the connection that I felt with this, the whole time you were pulling at my heart, the, oh. it, it was, it was, you know, it was very powerful. Um, oh. Thank you for making that journey. Well, thank you. And I apologize for it being so tough. But <laughs> I, I, I did a lot of research on the families of people that were missing, especially children that were missing and tried to figure out because many of them don't stay together. Many of them split apart. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and that, that's really, really hard to see them sort of tearing apart. Even after the worst has supposedly happened, mm -hmm. now even the person that's supposed to be helping you through life just can't go on with you. So I looked hard at that. And again, trying to figure out, you know, which way Ed and Fran were gonna go. You know, how, how were they gonna get through this? And Fran, of course, is a, is a take charge person. She, she, she has a mission. She says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to you know, pursue it to the very end. And then even after that, even if I can't, you know, save Kim, maybe I can save the rest of the world and save other families from this. Whereas Ed kind of goes inward and implodes in a way and questions everything that he ever thought about the town. Um, and he used to love the town. Um, and now he kind of hates everything. 
um, and finds no comfort in anything. He, he, he looks at everyone and everything around him as something that is going to be lost. Um, mm -hmm. There's that moment where he's, he's sitting there with the dog um, and he's thinking about his mother in the nursing home and, and realizes that she is going to die and that the dog that is providing him some comfort at that moment, the dog is also going to die, but he's going to have to say goodbye to both of them as well. You know, and, and what is left and what is left is, is Fran who doesn't understand them and he doesn't understand her. Um, so th those moments, which I always, I always tell my writing students, no one person scenes, you know, because not a whole lot can happen in a one person scene. And here is a book filled with one person scenes <laughs> uh, because a lot of these things simply, they can't share them with the ones closest to them. Mm. Uh, oh. and, that, and that's you know, another tragedy of the book. Okay. Yeah, that, that was the heart of the book for me, that how her disappearance and death affected each member of the family and each member of the community and her friends. And over the two-year period, how they deal with it, how they grow from it, I thought that was really interesting and important. Um, and I thought their marriage, actually their marriage did improve, Fran and Ed. You know, they, they start to grow closer together and realize the, how, how important they are to one another. He has his fishing. You know, she tries to take part in it. You know, and I, I was somewhat cheered by that and by their final celebration, you know, when they find finally find the, her remains, their final, final celebration of, uh, of her. I thought it, it ended on a lighter note, for that part of it, for me. I hope so. A little stronger note. Yeah. Yeah, it, it did. Um, they got through it. And I it just, it was tremendous. I kept thinking of Kim being 18 years old, the age of some of the students I taught. And I said, I can't imagine how anyone can even deal with this. You know, I, I it just, it, I don't know. I just, I wanted to know how she got there, how, how this happened. And, and, you know, it just, it's a mystery. Yeah, and, and throughout there's there's all the speculation. There's so many different stories that the, the different characters come up with for what might have happened or could have happened from the very beginning. I mean, yeah. when, when the father goes out to search for her the very first morning, he comes across that other car, you know, by the side of the highway and, and he begins to tell a story you know, in his mind about the girl who could have been in this car and it could have been Kim, even though it's not her car there. Yeah. So there's always a speculation, but there's never that is never the relief of being sure and of knowing there. And that's the, the terrible not knowing of yeah. it. But you, I, you brought that, 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 which seemed interesting to me and runs through the book was that difference between private and public. Because, because of what happens to Kim, they have to become this public face mm -hmm. of the tragedy. Yeah. And the mother is able to do that while the mm -hmm. father can't do that at all. So it becomes more and more private there. So that idea of, of private thought versus public speech uh, and that idea of public ceremony we have the you know the the, the big check at the halftime of the thanksgiving football game where you're in front of the entire community you've got the balloon release at the softball game you have all these these super public ceremonies that say our community is gathered together and then the community all goes away and they're left with it by themselves um, and and the media of course being all over them the entire time um, I have, a, I have a question about the um, woman whose home, um, the, I've forgotten names, the, the father was going to sell, the, the pianist from Pittsburgh. Why was she in the book? What, why, um, what part did she really uh, play in the rest of the story, I guess? Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm sure she's in there for something thematically. Um, is, is she by herself? Has she split with her husband? Is there? I don't think, I don't know that you said that. I, I think that she, you did say that she was longer playing the piano. She was a great pianist in, in, while she was growing up and her mother <laughs> was uh, worked in the library and would talk about what a wonderful pianist she was. And then when they, when he contacted her to sell her house, she wouldn't speak of it. She seemed to want to separate herself from the 
town. So I was thinking that maybe she was amongst those who wanted to get away. There were a lot of people that maybe wanted to get away. Yeah, and, and also the, the dreams of the parents for the child, right? Um, yeah. The dreams of, of her, her parents for her were for her to become this, this big superstar and it never happened for her. Um, no. So that, that disappointment also tied in with, you know, never wanting to come back and, and also not wanting to see the, the sight of, of, our, of our disappointments um, and, and when we disappoint other people. I also just wanted to, just a little personal thing. I moved here a year and a half ago from Morgantown, West Virginia. And so um, I just enjoyed all the references to the giant eagles. <laughs> that, was, that was my big store to shop in. <laughs> Or as, as, or as they call it, the dirty bird. It's yeah. a great, it's a great chain, actually. Oh, there was there was one on Route Seven in Conneaut, right off of the interstate there, um, that uh, you know a few years just suddenly closed. Now is the place that everybody went. All of a sudden, they just closed down. Um, oh. So it was a great indicator of you know how the town had kind of fallen on hard times. Yeah, something we know a little bit about here in Pittsburgh. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, um, I think choosing a title for a book that you write must be difficult. And I wondered why you chose the title that you chose. Mm -hmm. uh, I chose the title About a Girl um, after the Nirvana song. Um, it's, it's one of Nirvana's earlier songs. Not a huge hit, but um, sort of a classic you know, song about teenage angst and love and not knowing and, and, and loneliness. Um, and I, I really loved that title. It was on all of my, um, all of my discs and all my drafts and all that stuff. And uh, Viking did not like the title. Well, first, they didn't like the book. Um, they didn't like the book. They didn't like the title. You know, they didn't like me, whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I chose About a Girl. Which is, I mean, that's basically what the book is. It's trying to be about Kim and how we're seeing her from all around, but we can never quite get inside to really know who Kim was there. Everyone has their version of Kim. It's like, it's like the elephant and the blind men, right? Um, so I thought About a Girl was kind of appropriate. Um, Kurt Cobain and, and the, the sense of him was kind of floats over this book the way he also floats over um, uh, <coughs> the night country um, set in Avon. There's a quote from in the beginning of it. Anyway, uh, they didn't like it. And so they started kicking around titles. And I believe the new president of the company um, decided that Songs for the Missing was a really good title. And I didn't think it was a good title at all. Um, it seems a bit sentimental and corny. Um, I, I kind of see what she's saying, you know, that the there are all these dedications on the radio and the radio plays a big part um, in it. But uh, yeah, so they basically chose the title and titles are hard. Titles are really hard. I'm, um, sure, they, one, I'm sure they are, yeah. One reason they didn't want to go with About a Girl is because they thought it was too close to Nick Hornby's About a Boy. Um, um. To me, Nirvana is such a larger influence in the world than Nick Hornby could ever be. Um, Nick Hornby probably loves Nirvana, um, but understands that his position in the pop culture universe is very small compared to Nirvana. So what can I say? I got one more question. <clears throat> um, you might have sort of gone over this already, but I was surprised, and I bet I'm not alone, by the way the book ended. Uh, and you spend a lot of time in your book um, sort of, I'm not, I'm not sure what the right verb is, but misleading us perhaps, <laughs> or suggesting to us that one of these young kids might know something. They have a secret. They're not telling the secret. And I, I was convinced that one of the young kids had something to do with her disappearance. So my question is, uh, what what is the main point or the main idea that you hope people take away from your book, if there is one? A main point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, right. 
Okay. Well, if I, I mean, I have my own answer to my question to you, but and I'll tell you that in a minute. But I was just wondering. I mean, what what did you want people to walk away from this book with? Well, I, I think check Chekhov says that you know it, you you need to ask the most important question rather than provide the answer. And so that if you frame the question correctly, then maybe the reader will catch it and catch on and feel it rather than being told it. Um, yeah. So in this case, I would say it's, you know, how do we go on uh, in the face of the worst? How do people, how do people endure, basically? That's, that's a good answer, I think. My answer uh, isn't as good, but here's my answer to my own question. That we never know, no matter how hard we try, maybe, what really causes things. <laughs> or that mm. we, yeah, we always, things are so tricky in life that we just, it's really difficult to determine what really caused something to happen. And in this case, you know, some guy killed her apparently actually even that wasn't super clear to me even at the end of the book that i still wondered about this hoozy guy or whatever his name was in some sense you know yeah. and that idea that we we always want an answer when sometimes there isn't one no answer yeah yeah, yeah. 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 but i i think uh, in, in in this book especially in the way that it veers away from some of the conventions or, or promises of the genre it's probably owing to my reading a lot of Alice Munro because she writes a lot about the effect of the accidental on our lives, um, and especially over a long period of time. Yeah. And, and how the small things can have great repercussions, say 15, 20 years uh, down the line. Um, in this case, it's, it's only you know, two years or a couple months or weeks even. Um, but the small things that you took for granted um, and then just suddenly sort of yanked away from you and the, then the world and, and the abyss sort of yawns open at your feet. Um, what do you do then? Who do you hang on to? What do you fall back upon? Do you have some sort of faith? Um, do you have a faith in the people around you? Do you have a faith in the world as a whole? Do you have a faith in your community? Do you have a faith in God? Do you have a faith, you know? And again, this, this comes back in book after book after book of mine. Um, when the bad things happen, what do we fall back on? What do we do? Do we yeah. have something to fall back on? And if we don't have something to fall back on, that's when even worse things seem to happen, at least in, in my universe. I read a ton of Flannery O'Connor when I was younger. And so the, the, the punishments for not having faith are, are dire um, in those early books. Um, in the later books, not so much, I think. I think I separate myself from, from, from her worldview. Uh, but that question of whether we're saved by acts or whether we're saved by grace still comes into to my universe in book after book after book. Um, having just done A Prayer for the Dying last night, which is an overtly religious book, this book isn't quite as pointedly religious, um, but it, 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 it does dabble a little bit. I mean, we do have Father John. We do have the churches where they gather together to set up the first searches, um, the church bus, the church camp, you know, all that stuff. Um, well, That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks. Good question. Stuart, I have a question about your, your writing process. Who, when you're finishing a project or when you're first finished, who was your first reader? Uh, my wife, Trudy, is my first reader. Um, she's, she's my best reader and my toughest reader um, because she's not a literary person. She doesn't, she doesn't care how beautiful the sentences are. She doesn't care how striking, gorgeous, and well-chosen the detail is, how well the scene is set. Um, she wants things to happen, and she wants to root for characters, and she wants to understand characters. Um, and if she doesn't understand why these characters are the way that they are, then I've got some explaining to do. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and there's certain books of hers that I can tell that she likes them because she reads them quickly. When she's taking a long time to get through a manuscript that I've given her, I understand that it's, it's just, it's not working as well. <laughs> um, and there's certain books of mine that, that she just doesn't really care for. Uh, she's not a, not a great fan of. She's not a great fan of Last Night at the Lobster. Um, 
who knows why she loves a prayer for the dying which is a really weird book um but yeah she's she's always good and honest with me and then i have a first line of readers um who are a little bit more literary um but i still like to give the book to people that are basically genre writers um because i want to keep the scenes moving i mean I, i'm of two minds one is i want things to be plotted and eventful, things happen and have consequences and important consequences to people, their climaxes, their big scenes. Um, on the other side, I wanna get a little closer to how life really feels for us. Uh, back in the mid nineties, I was writing a lot of plotted fiction with like big climaxes and all this stuff. And I began reading a lot of uh, lyric poetry. And it, it seemed to me that the American lyric poetry coming out in the nineties got so much closer to how people really feel about themselves and the people around them and life and the important things in life than our fiction did because our fiction was a little bit too too story like too jokey too too conventional it was too they make too many narrative promises and life isn't quite like that so i had to figure out and especially in, in wish you were here i was trying to figure out how how do we go through life how do we see our lives how does time move for us what is what is foremost in our minds, right? What is important to us? Not, you know, oh my God, there's a murder and here are the suspects and all this stuff. But, you know, what's really important to us? And so I, I had to sort of pull back from that super plotted, eventful, boom, 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 you know, three explosions, each one bigger than the other. Um, action movie Spielbergian view of the world and get back to something a lot quieter and slower. And so... I, I got into this mode where I, my, my catchphrase was dare to be boring. Because um, a, lot, a lot of life is just boredom. A lot of life is routine. A lot, I mean, one of my readers in Iowa wrote me once. She said, your characters go to work, they come home and they watch TV. And I was like, that describes a lot of the country. A lot of that. We don't all live in penthouses in Manhattan. You know, we, we, we aren't all working at Vogue. You know, we're not in LA. We're not we're, you know, we're not, we're not superheroes. We're just regular people. Um, and I think I like writing about those people a lot more. Um, so even when I was writing about F. Scott Fitzgerald, someone says, well, you made him seem really normal. Well, he's just a human <laughs> being, you know, he's just a regular person. Um, we all are. Um, so I, I'm always torn between those two things there. Um, and, 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 sure. and, and, and I just and, say, like, today I was talking to a coworker at work and, you know, I said, oh, you know, are you going to try to come to the book discussion? And she said, well, you know, she's going to school. Well, I have papers to do and things like that. And so I said, well, and I'm glad you said it because I'm like, it's almost boring because life is boring, but you write it so eloquently, I have to say. <laughs> so <laughs> with beautiful prose. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to say, um, and, and I'm curious about how you decided this. I think it was about halfway through the book, you got me. I think it was like the first paragraph, I don't remember it exactly, but they found the body. Yeah, yeah, thought, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they found the body. <laughs> now, uh, oh, wow, I mean, it, and, and I, and then as it develops, it was, another body and I I mean I appreciated that um, that ex it, it, I felt like I was going through what those parents were going through but it was like you really just it, I thought it was brilliant I, I, and in a way I didn't like it at the same time you <laughs> fooled me you know you, I, I thought now I knew what was going to happen <laughs> and I'm curious oh. about deciding to do that or how that came about or well I mean, the goal is to convey to the reader how it feels to go through the experience mm. going through. And part of the experience is that, that, that false hope, you know, mm. and, and, and clutching, grasping at anything out there that might help because, because you're terrified and, and alone and have, have no clue what's going on. And so naturally every little thing, every little change there, you know, and after say four or five, six months, they're the only ones still mm. worried about. The rest of the world just goes on. They just do what they do. Um, and, and, you know, again, getting across, what is it like to be you? How does it feel to be you um, going through life? What's 
foremost on your mind right now, today? Uh, what's the urgency or not emer urgency, not urgency of emotion? Um, you know, even in, in something as boring as last night at the lobster, you know, Manny goes in and he sort of puts the coffee on, and he puts the chowder on and that sort of stuff. These are things that he has to do. They're the foremost at his mind. Um, what's going on with you today? Again, how we see our days. You know, when, when you woke up this morning, what was your day going to be like? You had some inkling of it. You knew the things that you had to accomplish. You knew the things that might, you know, that you might do today or that you should do today. And then all this other stuff sort of came in. You had to deal with that stuff. And, you know, things popped up and you get distracted. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, did you get a lot done? Did you get nothing done? Um, and are your problems still the same? You know, are the relationships that are difficult for you still difficult? You know, can you say what you want to say to that person who is closest to you that you know you can't say because it would change the way that you see each other? You know, all, all those, you know, you're balancing that stuff all the time, but what's right at the front of your mind? I want to try to keep, keep that there with my characters as they move through their days. Yeah. Right. My mother used to say, you know, put yourself in another person's shoes. I think you do a brilliant job of being in other people's shoes and letting and expressing, you know, their, their, um, their experience in a moment. Well, that's, that's the hope because that's, that's what I love reading fiction. I mean, that's, that's the, the trade-off for me that the, the joy of fiction re reading is you get to jump into this person that otherwise you would have never met, you would have never thought about their life and what they're going through. And you can get close to them and care about them in a way that sometimes you don't even care about, you know, real people in the real world. <laughs> you, you invest yourself in their feelings and what they're going through. Um, and, and, and my hope is that readers will do that for my characters too and spend time with them. And that's always the amazing thing, you know, when, when people talk about the characters as if they're real people going through real things, because that's, the way that I, I like to see them. Um, and I, I think only, only fiction, well, I mean, I think the novel does this better than almost any other form, I think, um, to, to bring us into the way one person, one other person feels and really submerge you in what's going on in their life. Um, film can't quite do it in the same way because you're always outside shooting them looking at them from the outside, but here you can you delve in and get to those very, very private moments, incredibly private moments where these characters reveal themselves, uh, where they wouldn't reveal themselves to anyone else in the world, but they reveal themselves to us, the readers. Um, and, and in some way implicitly ask us for mercy or compassion or love. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, that's, that's what I'm asking the reader is to care about these people that I care about and that are worth caring about because they do love other people. They do worry about other people. Um, they try to do their best for other people, sometimes in impossible situations, but they try. Um, and, they're, and they're aware of their failings too, right? These are, these are people that still have a sense of shame and a sense of right and wrong and a moral compass. And they understand even when they have to do these terrible things, they understand that they are doing them. Um, certainly the way that Lindsay treats her parents, having to break away from them, she, she, she understands that, she knows that. And, and, and somewhere deep inside her, she's sorry for that, um, but she has to do it anyway to save herself. Um, right. well, I would like to add on to what Carol said. I thought the, ju the juxtaposition of, she finally gets her license and all of it, 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 you build up to that, the practice and she gets her license and the, like the very next page is they find a body. So you find you're on the high, you finally hit a high point emotionally in the book and it just makes you crash even harder when, when you, you know, they find the, the first body. Um, so I thought that was really brilliantly done. Um, Thanks. It, and I also think uh, I, I, I agree with what everyone is saying that you really, really have a special gift for capturing the everyday experience and the everyday emotions of people. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a third grade teacher and books, we, we talk about how books are windows, books are mirrors and books are sliding doors. And for someone who's ever experienced that deep grief, I mean, I, ha I, I too had to put the book down. I know people who've lost siblings at a young age. I mean, you captured every type of grief, heaviness, sadness, depression, um, 
and so for someone who's never experienced it, I think that really is a window for people um, and, and a gift um, for people. Um, Cause it's certainly not, none of this is anything that anyone would ever want to experience. Um, and the little daily reminders, like, the, when you wrote about the kitchen table, it always come with four chairs. And looking at that table every day is a reminder that that chair is empty. Um, so I, I, I cannot say enough, uh, give you enough high praise for capturing that everyday life experience, um, especially on the sorrowful side of it. Um, and then I guess I had one question I wanted to ask you. There was that other scene. There was a scene where they were all in the same room. The three of them were in the same room together, which was a very rare moment after Kim disappeared it, and I think it was the mother who the idea popped in her head to say, we're all in the same room because that's something they used to say when all four of them would be in the same room. And as a parent, I know it's very, especially teenagers, it is extremely rare to have the whole family in the room. Um, so I was just wondering if that was just something, an imaginative um, thing that came to you in the writing process, or is that something that you either experienced, you heard or in your own house when someone, you all ended up together, that was something that was said. Yeah, that's that's a family thing. It's whole family in one room. Um, yeah, because I mean, having teenagers, they're never around. They're trying to never be around. So it's a very <laughs> rare experience to have the whole family in one room. And of course, in the context of Kim never coming back, um, it's, it's very telling. And then with Lindsay, too, because Lindsay, you know, is going to be away as well. Um, so what is the whole family? You know, when the, when the children leave, what, what is the family? Is it the same? No, it's, it's very, very different. And that fear of, of what is going to happen when Lindsay leaves, I think, you know, pierces both Fran and Ed separately. Um, and yet, when she leaves, somehow they, they, by necessity, they fall together a little bit more um, than they could when Lindsay was around. Um, yeah. Which is tough. Which is tough. I mean, and we're, we're all gonna, yeah, I'll have to you know, let go of the children at some point, you know. And, but but I, I had a lot of help um, in coming up with a lot of the details for, for what the families are going through, not just from my friend um, uh, out in the Midwest, um, but from the whole support network that surrounds missing and exploited children. There are many, many different um, organizations uh, online and their testimonies are online and their stories are there's there's always somebody going missing so there's always these mm -hmm. testimonies by friends by parents by siblings that they're online and, and they're just they're just pouring their hearts out about how life is now and how they want life to change and so i could i could look at all of that material and be very selective and say you know what what have i seen a million times because Again, there are millions of television shows about missing people um, uh, and specials and Dateline and 2020 and the missing, especially the missing young girl is a staple of the TV magazine show. Um, so I had to be a little bit more selective. And by having access to a lot of first person narratives, um, I, I was able to, to come up with enough, enough material to, to keep it fresh and to keep it, I, I hope, um, so word for it, um, in, insightful, I guess. Um, but that, that's typical because I'll, I'll take on material that people have done a million times, like the Vietnam War or the car crash or whatever. Um, and, and you want to you sort of mine all those details to go a little deeper um, and to get your characters a little sharper, uh, make the war a little sharper and, and more real because uh, people don't want to deal with, with what's real. Um, so, so when you can put it out there and it's real, it's, it's a little refreshing, I think. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I, I have a question. Um, maybe it was done intentionally. I really wasn't clear where Kim was and how that guy got her. And, and the car thing with the broken key and the father mentioning a gas can at, it was um, sort of mysterious to me. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes, purposely mysterious. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I mean, we, we know where we saw her last. Yeah, uh, she was on her know. way to work, right? She was yes. right. to work. Yep, she was on her way to work. She's in the car, she's in the Chevette. And the Chevette is, again, like second line of the book, I think, it was the summer of her Chevette. Right. Um, yep. uh, and, and JP, two things that are just not gonna last, the Chevette and JP. Um, and, 
yeah, she's in the Chevette. She's, she's vulnerable. Um, she's a target and she disappears and we just, we don't know. And, and she run out of gas. I mean, I, I didn't get the thing with the gas can. The father says, well, I know there wasn't a gas can in the car. She would have just called if she ran out of gas. I don't know how this guy nabbed her. Right. Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah we, we weren't meant to know. <laughs> no, we weren't meant to know. No. And they, and they weren't meant to know. Oh, well, that's the yeah. thing. They, they, they want to know every little detail and it's, it's denied them almost, almost fully denied them. All they have is this result. Um, and it's not, what's the word for it? It's not somehow not satisfying. It's not, it's not just, oh. um, it's wrong. Um, yeah, but that's all they get. All, that is all they get is that result. But by the same token, and, and I think Fran says this, that at least they have her back. Right. 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 Which doesn't, it, it, you'd think it wouldn't help anybody, um, but it, it does in a weird way. Um, and also that, again, mother after mother after mother of missing children and, and, and murdered children worry about the children being cold out there in the night and alone, alone and cold out in the night, even though they're dead already and they've been dead for years, but, th but they worry about that. that that's just, just somehow natural. It's the way that people think. Um, and so, you know, having to run into those things again and again and again, it was, it was a long, it was a long time writing the damn book. Um, <laughs> I, Stuart, can I just ask you, in, in your writing, you, are you energized? Are you sort of emotionally drained? Does it depend on what you're writing about? Or is it the same each, each time you go to do a project? Um, it, it seems to be a little bit the same every time I'm on a project because I, I become very uh, obsessive um, or, you know, stri strictly obsessive compulsive. Um, I fall deeply into the material. I become fascinated by it. I want to know everything about it. I become super curious. Um, I do a lot of research, a lot of legwork. Um, uh, I, I hit up the, the reference librarians. Boy, they, they, they see me coming. I like to hear that. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, here he comes. Oh no. Um, yeah, and uh, I interloan, just interloan hundreds and hundreds of books. And uh, you know, I, I want to see what's already been done in this particular genre. I mean, if I'm writing about a missing girl, I want to see everything that's been done about missing girl. What are the cliches? What do you have to avoid? Um, you know, how do, how do you use this particular genre? What kind of book is this? Um, this turned out to be a, the small town book. It's like uh, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. You have five or six people in a small town that are loosely connected to each other. Uh, and they're going to tell their stories. Their stories do rub up against each other, but not in any sort of super causal way. Um, so they're, they're alone, but together, and they see each other over and over again. So it's a book about loneliness, Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, it, it feels the same because... I just get obsessed with the characters, how they're feeling, what they're thinking about, how they see the world. Um, and to understand how they see the world, I take them out into the world with me. So when, when I'm writing this book, I'll be Lindsay. If I'm going to the, the grocery store, I'm going to try to see the grocery store in the way that Lindsay would see the grocery store. Um, mm -hmm. Or if I'm Ed, I'll try to you know, go, I don't know, to a restaurant um, and see how Ed would see a restaurant uh, in his current state of mind, how he sees that motel when he goes to the, that other town to find out about her. Um, he's seeing that motel in a way that only Ed is going to see that motel. Um, you know, Lindsay would see it in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that idea of the energized character um, really excites me because then I get to take on that energy and, and see the world in a different way. Um, and that, that's the same no matter what project. As long as it's fiction, nonfiction, whole different deal, whole different deal. Uh, but in fiction, it's always get into the get into the character, try to understand their emotion, try to understand what's important to them, what their past is like, how they see the world now, and who are the people closest to them. Where is where is the, the conflict there? Where is the difficulty? Uh, where, where, what are the things that they can't say? Uh, Linda Barry, the cartoonist, says, "Where does the monster live?" You know, mm -hmm. And so when I'm thinking about character, I'm always thinking, where does the monster live? Dennis Lehane, great, great uh, mystery writer, says, uh, look for the lie. Look for the mm -hmm. lie. If you find the lie, then you find what motivates that character, 
What does that character lie about? Who do they lie to? Um, because the lie is always, it's always going to come out, right? The truth is always going to come out. That's one thing we know. Um, it's going to, it's going to reveal itself. It may take forever, but it's going to reveal itself. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. I had, I just thought of this. The conventional wisdom is that when a young woman um, dies or is missing, it's usually the beautiful blonde uh, person that catches the national attention. In this case, she was a beautiful blonde, right? I'm not sure she was blonde, but she was beautiful anyway. And, um, and it didn't seem to catch the national attention, even when she was killed by a serial killer. So did you think about that or did, was that- Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what is, what is gonna be at the, the forefront of, you know, and, and how the media plays with it there? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't become the huge, huge news. Um, maybe because so much else was going on. I think Natalie Holloway is in there as well, right? Yeah. 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 There, there, are, there are blonder and prettier and more interesting cases than hers. Um, and and that's, that's the terrible thing is that hundreds, hundreds of children go missing every month. Um, they can't all be Natalie Holloway. They can't all be you know, the headliners there. Um, which, is, which is part of the irony about the way that Fran you know, plays up her you know, weird celebrity um, in, in becoming this advocate there. I mean, she, she begins to draw a crowd. She begins to be an expert at this, but she'll never be the expert that Natalie Holloway's mother is, um, which is, which is kind of horrible in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any more questions for, for Stuart? Mm -hmm. More I, comments? I, I, Kelly? Um, well, one of the things that, um, that I liked the most about the book. It was hard for me to say that I enjoyed it because I'm a mom of three girls. So reading <laughs> sorry, thinking the worst, you know, I kind of struggled through it. Um, but I liked that it wasn't like a detective mystery, try to solve the case that the focus was more on the emotions of all of the, the characters. And um, for me, one of the biggest things that I kind of pulled away from the story was this sense of when, if ever, would you stop looking? And you can kind of see like, like the, the friends kind of fade away first. Like they, they don't search as long. The mother, she would probably continue for the rest of her life looking. And one part that stood out the most to me was at the very end when her body was found and Ed has this moment where he realizes that he had stopped. He had stopped searching. And the woman who found Kim's body had never stopped. And it's like that, that conflict of, um, you know, his emotions at that time of, you know, how, how could I have stopped searching when this total stranger didn't? Um, so that, that was just probably it's hard to say it was my favorite part but um I, I thought that that was just that was fascinating the way that you know all of those emotions and then to get like right to the very end having you know ed kind of be in that moment um i thought it was brilliantly written well that that's an another question that comes up in book after book line is when do you give up hope mm -hmm. right um ed ed is the first person to search for her in, in that very opening section he goes out in his car and tries to find her and there's supposed to be this mastery he's the father he's supposed to be the protector um and the guardian and the, the the warrior and the avenger and all these things and again and again he goes out and he goes out and he goes out and he can't do anything and it becomes instead of mastery it turns into helplessness which is the reality of the situation the tv shows are all about mastery right they're all about here are all these clues and i can look through them and i can find out exactly where this blade of grass came from. And this brings me to this person's basement in you know, Elkhart, Indiana. And only this kind of sweatshirt was made once and it was only sold here. Whereas Ed, he doesn't understand anything. The world is overwhelming. His daughter is missing. She's probably dead. He kind of understands that she's dead. And he, in a way, logically gives up and surrenders there and then feels terrible guilt and shame for it. Whereas his wife, Fran, can't surrender. She keeps crusading even beyond where she really should. It's not really doing anybody any good except her. In a weird way, it's a very selfish thing to do. 
very odd way there. And he doesn't understand it at all. And she doesn't understand him at all. And they're totally going the opposite ways, which happens with so many couples in this situation. Yeah, and it seemed like everybody else kind of noticed too that Fran like physically was a completely different person. You know, mm-hmm. she she had lost weight. She did the makeup and the hair and got all dolled up for all of her like appearances and everybody seemed to recognize that change too. And Ed had been a very sort of a, a recognizable face in the community. He's the realtor, right? He He's his person he sells himself as this image, right? And that all goes away. And he becomes this, this almost a recluse in a yeah, way. Well, see him. Time, again, when, when Fran's on camera, there's always this comment of like, he's in the background, he's off to the side, he's not even in the picture. And as it goes further into the book, she becomes more, what's the word for it? Um, more energetic about getting out there and being more public. And he withdraws further and further and further, um, which, I, it, it's, it's, which is the right way to go. We don't know, um, pro- probably neither, both. I mean, it, what can you do? So it's an impossible situation. This is just the way that they've found to, to deal with it. Um, it's hard, it's really hard. Uh, and, and Lindsay, of course, has a whole different way. Um, which is maybe a more immature, younger way of doing it, um, but but no, no less easy, I think. And and then you have Elise and JP too. They don't even know where they stand with respect to the family anymore because their connection was always through Kim. Um, they know Kim probably better than anybody, but it doesn't matter in a way that Kim is someone who's been kind of put away for this this image of Kim. And yeah. yeah, the three amigos. Yeah. Kim, Kim and Nina and Elise. You know, I, I, I really, really love them. I, I and I love them together in a way. Um, and even when Nina and Elise are together, I think they're out on the railroad tracks at some yeah. point. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and you know, I just just think of them missing missing Kim. It's, you know, yeah, those those were to me, those were like the, the, the most important scenes of you know, understanding that the world has changed and it's never going to be the same again. Um, so, well, thank you for reading it. I appreciate it. Um, Enjoyed I'm, it. I'm, I'm sorry it's so, it's so tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you for coming. For, oh, yeah. for Stuart, last thank thing. You. Anything in thank the works? Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. That was very illuminating. Really. Thank you. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, my, uh, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I just finished a new novel. Um, it's called Ocean State. It's set in a small town in Rhode Island, uh, near Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, it's about a teenage love triangle um, and a murder. Uh, two sisters, two kind of strange sisters. Uh, and the way that they see each other and the town that they live in and their mother. So it's all female points of view. Um, it's concerned mostly with, I, I guess the, well, I, I, can't, I can't really say, I can't really sort of put it <laughs> together now. It's still, it's still too a little raw. I still have edits to do with my, with my editor, um, but it's, it's pretty much done. It's, it's partly, Shirley Jackson, I think. Um, if you know the book, uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. it's, it's about this, the, the very strange connections uh, within family, I guess, and the way that family sees one another. Um, but it's creepy. It's a Halloween book. Um, it's, it's, my, it's my fourth Halloween book. I just, I, I love Halloween. So it, it, every four or five years, it kind of, you know, floats <laughs> Um, and it's it's weird. It, it owes a little bit to um, To Kill a Mockingbird, in some ways, and yeah. So imagine To Kill a Mockingbird written by Shirley Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! It's I read freaky. one of his books uh, several years ago, um, The Perfect Wife. Oh yeah, The Good Wife. Yeah. The Good Wife. I think it was. 
Yeah, okay, the good wine. Yeah, yeah it was very good. I, I don't remember too much of it because it's been a, a long time now, but I think it did have something to do with, with victimhood, as I recall. And uh, that's why I was interested in reading this one. Yeah, that one uh, is about a woman whose husband is sentenced to 25 years to life for murder. Um, and oh. so it's basically, it's about how she becomes this other person, changes into a much stronger person just to get through her life um, yeah. in a way. And, and so it's, it's really about, it's really about sort of taking control of a life that when she began, when the book begins, she's just kind of the wife, she's the pregnant wife. And then she has to learn to do everything everything um yeah patty yeah. interesting interesting character uh, i like that one thanks thank but again it's what is it like to be you uh, i started i started reading all these books about prison and they were so focused on the people that were inside the prison i started thinking about the people that were outside the prison waiting and there's millions and millions of them um, and i hadn't read anything about them and so i started yeah. doing some research and talked to women that were in that situation. I thought it was just fascinating that they have to take on everything. You know, they, they, they have to raise the children. They, you know, they, they, it, it's incredible um, how strong they have to be. And I thought, well, that's, you know, this is an important story. And so I just started, you know, trying to dig into it. And, yeah. but again, small town stuff. You know. Again, thank you all for coming. I appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. much. Stay safe. Let's hope better times are ahead, but until then, be very careful out there. Yes, thank you.